afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the MEF Connects Digital uh, session and today's webinar on digital identity entitled Trust in the Digital Economy. How can identity solutions help enterprises mitigate the erosion of consumer trust in transactional digital services? That's a very long title. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian McCann from MEF. And I'll be moderating today's session um, and moving forward we plan to hold some monthly webinars on this and other areas that fall under MEF's personal data economy program which was formerly which some of you some of our older members might recognize as formerly uh, consumer trust uh, which is one of the core MEF programs alongside messaging and regulation. Um, for those of you that are new to MEF uh, just a bit of housekeeping Bit of explanation about who we are and what we do. Uh, MEF is a global trade body that represents stakeholders in the mobile content and commerce spaces and provides its members with a global platform for networking, collaboration and advancing solutions to industry issues via working groups and uh, ecosystem interactions globally. Uh, that's a, a small the majority of what we do in addition to, to events and other, other activities. Um, we expect today's webinar to run for around 45 minutes um, and it is being recorded so you can share with colleagues uh, if you wish after, the, uh, after this and there will be a blog to follow uh, with all the links being published both on the site and in a follow-up uh, email to those of you who've all registered in the, in the next few days. Um, I'd like to point out at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions for either myself or the panel, hopefully the panel rather than me, because they're the interesting ones. Um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button, so uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout the, uh, the webinar today. Uh, we'd really like your interaction and your views. Um, so I'd like to start by welcoming you, our audience, to, to today's webinar and to today's pad panel with whom uh, we're going to explore this uh, really interesting topic. Um, we'll start with Sean Brown, who's uh, the CEO of Trunomi. Frank Joshi, uh, who is the MD of, um, sorry, the Managing Director of Envine, and David Pollington, currently Head of Services at the GSMA. And gentlemen, could I ask you in that order to introduce yourselves briefly and declare your particular interest in the, the uh, subject under discussion today? So Sean, over to you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name's Sean Brown. I am the CEO of Trunomi. Trunomi are a data consent and permissions platform, but we do something slightly different. Uh, we leave source documents where, where they are, and we use our patented technology to share the intelligence around databases and organizations while keep, keeping source documents safe and secure in their home location. We work across all of the verticals in the digital world, and today uh, we've deployed into the uh, AWS uh, cloud, and that's given us reach across the globe. Uh, we started off in the banking sector, and we've quickly moved on into media, into mobile, into digital itself, working with brands, working with banks, working with charities, broadcasters, they all seem to have the same problem, and we think we've got a quite a nice way of helping companies solve their digital challenge and certainly around uh, identity. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Frank? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Joshi. I'm from a company called Mvine. Our thesis is that the, the future of the internet is predicated on solving the identity issue. Who are you online? And it's not just about people, but also in the future about things. And our particular uh, platform helps uh, provide what's called federated identity, where we can create what are called zero trust environments and integrate with what's, what's referred to as multiple sources of identity and link them with multiple uh, application providers. One particular project that may be of interest as we as a conversation progresses is our, our involvement in something called gov.uk verify, which is, the U, which is the UK government scheme for creating identities for all of us uh, potentially on this call. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, David, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Um, so David Pollington, I work at the GSMA, which is the trade body for the mobile operator community. Um, I work on the technology side of the fence, really looking at how mobile devices and mobile networks have a range of assets that can be brought to bear 
to improve the situation online in terms of trust and enabling users both to be able to identify themselves securely, authenticate and control how information about them, the personal data is shared. Um, so we've had a, a program of activi uh, activity running for about five years now called Mobile Connect within the GSMA, um, which is being deployed by mobile operators on a worldwide basis. Okay, thank you. And I probably should um, uh, declare my own sort of interest in this subject. Uh, I was at the GSMA for a number of years trying to persuade network operators uh, in the regions in which I worked to launch Mobile Connect, the GSMA and mobile industries sort of version of uh, digital identity. So my focus is very much that. And obviously what I'm hoping for today is a much sort of broader discussion around the, um, around the digital ecosystem. Um, let's start off. So, you know, given that the industry has seen several very serious, you know, breaches of data over the last few years, and the old concept of username and password is seen as rife with security and usability issues by all serious players in the ecosystem, let's sort of take it as read that there is a significant demand for a new safe and secure means for both individuals and corporate entities. That's an important point to be able to assert their identity in the digital world and that in both this um, in both the consumer and enterprise space there are signs of mistrust and nervousness developing particularly around the transactional space but also you know around the ability to securely assert one's identity attributes and personal data for more complex digital endeavors you know i don't just mean necessarily just paying for things but interacting with services frank mentioned gov uh, or verified there you know in, with government services particularly in the medical field you know this is going to be incredibly important so um in addition to that you know there are many organizations out there today who are trying to position themselves as potential trusted guardians of citizens personal data um, in addition to that the relatively new or certainly to me concept of self-sovereign identity where uh, the citizen if i've understood it correctly the citizen themselves uh, owns and manages or shares their own data uh, all of this makes for a pretty complicated ecosystem and after sort of 18 months out of the industry myself and attending a couple of uh, industry events recently i was was I surprised? Probably not. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I was a little surprised at how sort of complex and diffuse an environment the identity sort of firmament had remained, you, you know, even perhaps more so than, than when I last visited it. So for those um, who are on the webinar who perhaps uh, don't know too much about identity, if we can start with some definition stuff. If we can start with basic definition here. Um, so, for example, the GSMA in a report with the World Bank last year defined a digital identity as a collection of electronically captured and stored identity attributes, including biographic data and biometric data that uniquely describe a person within a given context and are used for electronic transactions. So that's quite a... Um, that's a really interesting take on what identity is. Does the panel agree with this definition as a starting point? And if so, why, why not? Um, Sean, can I start with you? No, thanks, Ian. I think it's, uh, I think it's an interesting viewpoint um, because ultimately we need first to understand the standards of a definition. So the GSMA is creating its own standard and what it believes is the standard of a different definition in the marketplace. The big challenge we have is, is much greater where, when you move from company to company, from vertical to vertical, and then from country to country. What we're all going to have to agree on is some form of identity. Today, the one thing that we all associate with identity, perhaps, is a passport. But that's not necessarily a means of identity. It's a means of travel. It's a permission to allow you to travel in country. So if we come back and look at what the GSMA have said, they're, they're stating that it is a group of documents that are combined together to identify you, myself, or anyone else. <clears throat> but those underlying documents, it is there where the first problem begins in this environment. Because if we don't use the same baseline of doc documentation, then there is an argument to state that we could actually be looking at apples and oranges when we're trying to compare people or compare particular services. 
So I think the fundamental question has to go back a little further than what the GSMA may have addressed and understand what it is that's going to be used to formulate that identity of a human being on an exact basis. Before we just move over to Frank Fay's view on that, Sean, is, do you have a view on who, uh, on you, you know, the, the idea that there is somebody who will, uh, we will all get together and you know decide exactly what these definitions are? Do you think who do you think that person is or that body is? Well, in, interestingly, for for years, uh, Ian, you and I both have a mobile background, and if you think today, uh, one of the organizations that could provide a definition is actually the mobile operators they hold something that is absolutely unique to you and to me and that's our mobile phone number and if you look at how many people hold a mobile phone around the world today that's actually live and usable that could be a very basic form of id that could form the foundation layer of an identity of someone and move from there. And it already works across border. There is already an infrastructure that's understood that carries that information that allows you and I to speak and also to message and do all the other great things that we can do today on a smartphone. Okay. So that's one of the first places. Okay, thank you. Uh, Frank, if, sorry, if you can remember the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving to me first. <laughs> um, uh, Yes, yeah, so yeah, your your understanding of, of identity and, and you know, have the GSMA sort of got it right there? Is it not right? If not, why? And uh, please, your view on that would be very welcome. It's a great start. And as, as I think everybody will appreciate, uh, identity is quite a complex subject. It's also about context. So as Sean mentioned, you know, <clears throat> whilst the mobile operators know a lot about us, given that there's a, a link between an individual and a mobile number, that one of the big problems is that that's an attribute associated with you as an individual, but who's the person behind it? Uh, because that still could be a fraudulent actor. So there's got to be a distinction made between user attributes and verified identity. And how do you assert that verified identity in the appropriate context. Mm -hmm. So for example, as, as Sean was mentioning, it's great that we've got, we can fall back on what's called a document checking service to, we rely on, for example, the, the, the driving license and passport. And as long as those were created and they bound the individual successfully <clears throat> to those documents, then if you can go back to the passport office and say, somebody's rocking up as, uh, as Ian, here's his photograph, uh, passport office is that a valid passport yes uh, therefore can I now assert this to be Ian in this context going forward the answer is yes in that case but still it comes back down to whether the individual was properly bound at the very start otherwise these are all attributes which can have strong authentication going forward in time but if you were a dog to start with you're still a dog going forward in time on the internet you know, hence the the very famous uh, the cartoon so as i said you've got to you've got to separate the 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 whole issue of attributes associated with you and you being verified successfully but just to add to that if you don't mind there's there's a number of schemes that are already starting to to potentially develop in the market you've got the likes of the the government which is creating something called gov.uk verify and the idea is that you will use an existing what they call an idp there are five commercial companies that you can create an identity with and guess what they go through the document checking service amongst other things and uh they they tap in on mobile attributes to create an identity for you which you can assert to access government services <laughs> And there are other players in the market as well, such as uh, banks that may be coming on board through open banking and, and other schemes that uh, look as if they're going to start to emerge over time. Yeah, uh, we can talk about that actually a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, who the principal actors are in the, in the identity ecosystem in a second. Um, but David, um, this is probably, uh, uh, so <laughs> it, it, I'm handing you a poison chalice here. So that, 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 uh, that definition of, um, of personal data seems pretty good to me. Is, does, it still, does it still ring true for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing we've got to really look at here is, is what is the purpose of this ident uh, identity? You know, we, we've been talking about 
Um, how do you actually do a kind of a, I know your customer verification to going from physical documents through to a digital version of, of that identity to use it on, online. But the point is, is do you really need that in the first place? You know, to go back to what you were saying about earlier, Ian, you were talking about um, usernames and passwords. So we need to be very careful and delineate between identity of an individual and knowledge of whether or not this is the right person that is making a request to access a particular resource or to assert um, a particular claim. So for instance, if I'm only trying to assert that I'm over 18 so I can buy fireworks, you don't need to know my identity. Um, if I'm trying to you know, make a, a, a commerce transaction, you need to know a verified shipping address and you need to know my name. But the information that we share needs to be proportionate to, to purpose. And if you think about it, it's very rare that we get out our passports or our driving licenses in the real world, in the physical world, to prove our identity. We transact all the time across a whole range of different services. Um, and we don't need to do that because it's all based on the fact that you're there in person, and you're actually transacting with the individual. So it's actually about trust. Do you trust this person you're transacting with? And is this person, if you like, got the right to be able to make a request or a claim for whatever it is they're trying to access? So you've got to be very careful about identity versus, if you like, authentication. Yes, that's a, that's a really good point. Thank you for, for making that. That's, uh, so the, the context in which um, an assertion of identity or authentication, as you point out, is required depends very much on the uh, on what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, something just popped into my head there. You know that instance where you know you sometimes go into shops and first thing they ask you is uh, your, you know, it's a really good way of getting information out of people. They ask you straight away for your uh, email address, and you know I think when it first started, I found myself you know just handing it over and I was thinking, what the hell am I doing? You know, so the that's a that's not a great way for a retail outlet or a brand to harvest you know customer information i don't think it's um, it's quite intrusive you know and it sets up a bit of a barrier certainly between me and the shop assistant when i tell them that no you're not having that so the the I'm just trying to sort of uh, put that in the context of, a, a, of a, a digital relationship with a brand. It's very important, as you say, that we get correct the level of, you know, we talk about levels of assurance, which we can talk about in a bit more detail as to what is attributable to the particular transaction. And when I say transaction, I don't necessarily mean financial, but, you know, what it is we're trying to achieve in the, in the context in which we find ourselves. Um, so that's uh, that's very interesting viewpoints there. Thank you for that. Um, and going back to some of what Frank talks about, um, we're going in a slightly different direction. Uh, but Frank, could I ask you uh, before the other two, who who are the principal players in today's identity ecosystem? And you know, are you able to sort of flesh that out for the for the audience? Absolutely. <clears throat> and actually, just picking up on David's point, and it's worth to. Uh, reiterate there's a big distinction between let's call it day one <clears throat> verifying you as an identity to access a service and then you on you, you on an ongoing basis authenticating yourself uh, so it's a bit like day one you'll turn up with your passport and your driving license and your three documents to prove where you live in the last three months to open up a bank account or to uh, open up an account with a lawyer but there afterwards, you don't have to do that. So there's a distinction to be made between day one verification and ongoing uh, authentication. So the, there's, there seem to be a number of things happening in the market. I, I mentioned earlier that the UK government is trying to, trying, uh, is instantiating a scheme and has been for the last four years called gov.uk verify. There are now about three and a half to four million uh, UK citizens uh, using it to access now about 20 different government services. There's a reason why perhaps all of us on this call don't know about it, and that's possibly one of the reasons for its current failing. It was supposed to have achieved 25 million users by 2020. Mm. But uh, let's not get political about um, how, how our governments are operating at the moment. Everybody's smiling. So there's a scheme there that's being run by the government, which is going to create and has created a government-assured identity to what's referred to as LOA2. 
a level of assurance too, where the identity providers have actually taken individuals through a, a series of checks uh, using driver's license, passport, and uh, identity documents. But there are other schemes and players that are starting to emerge and are starting to talk about providing identity services. You've got uh, the likes of MasterCard and Visa who have made all sorts of announcements in the market about creating some kind of identity framework and fabric. <clears throat> and you can see them as being potentially logical players in that space, because apart from having to conform ultimately uh, within the PSD2 and MIFID2 environment, you can see that they've got some global infrastructures that they'd like to leverage and continue to monetize. Another interesting group are the banks. Now, in a lot of other countries, in Nordics and in Canada and in other places around the world, the governments have actually mandated the banks in those countries to become identity providers. We've not done that in the UK, but through open banking, it looks as if that uh, the way in which that has been written, the banks themselves could also become identity providers. And then there are other schemes involving uh, specific uh, private sector organizations, but perhaps I'll leave those for now. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Sean, back to you. In terms uh, of, sorry, in terms of, uh, yeah, who, who, who are the principal players in the ecosystem for, for, from your perspective? Well, well, I think we, we have to sort of sit up and take note of the big organisations who are really trying to make headway in this space. Um, Frank already mentioned uh, MasterCard, Visa, but also people like Google, uh, Microsoft, IBM, they're all forging ahead. They're, they're putting huge budgets aside and re re reported to be in the billions to actually try and solve identity on a global scale. Uh, but let's just reflect on something that's just happened this week because it would possibly seem like a next logical step for a company that made a big announcement this week, and that's Apple. Apple already have a huge amount of data. They hold more credit card details than anyone else in the world. So if you want to start talking about identity, they've just made it now possible for you to sign up for a new credit card with MasterCard technology behind it literally online. They know a huge amount about us. And what's more, they're already trusted by a huge amount of people. And so we've got the other side that, that certainly doesn't like Apple and the way Apple operates in its walled garden. However, they could actually produce their, their own standard of identity. And what they have in, in terms of an advantage perhaps to others is they already have a complete network that's built where they could actually allow people to pull that data from them to attest who you are, what it is you're doing, because they already have these relationships and they're already in a position of trust. And I think one of the big challenges anyone entering this space is going to have is, is that end-to-end -end connectivity between whoever's produced the identity here and however it's produced and how I can share it and use it over here. And so I think people like... Apple, if they wanted to go down that route, could be in a, a good place. Um, but certainly, we can't ignore people like Microsoft, who, if you look at the most deployed software in the world, they have a lot of details around consumers. Uh, and again, Google and IBM, you know, the, these people can all actually start in this place. It's whether they want to. And I think that's the big question. It's whether they want to. It is a complex challenge. Yeah. Um, I've actually had a couple of uh, co uh, comments and uh, a comment and a question in. I'll wait actually until um, David. Could you give your uh, your view on this on on who the principal um, players are that you know that the audience need to need to be cognizant of who um, who play a particularly uh, important part in the ecosystem? Yeah, sure. So if we're talking about you know real identity, true person identity then it's whoever's got access and has actually verified that information about you and can then assert that information to allow you to then assert your identity online. So obviously, uh, lots of the regulated industries, the banks, the telcos, as Frank has already touched on, they have to know who you are. It's part of what's called the KYC requirements or the AML requirements for the banks as well. So they, they have that information. And then, you know, to Sean's point, there'll be a lot of... Um, commercial companies, you know, private sector companies that have amassed similar amounts of data in order to, to operate their daily businesses. 
So any of these players could essentially decide that they want to now step up. And rather than just using this information for their own purposes, they could present themselves as identity providers to then allow you as an individual to actually share that information on an as-needed basis with any kind of online service that, that needs to access it. So I think that's really the key thing is who's got the information? Is it in their interest to actually then step into the shoes of being an identity provider uh, and, and sharing it? So that's something that we've been working on within the GSMA with the Mobile Connect Initiative. They, the mobile operators, they're all regulated. They have to know who their customers are. The Mobile Connect framework just provides a very simple mechanism for the user to be able to say via their mobile device whether or not they want that information to be shared um, and, and with whom. So that's really what Mobile Connect is all about. And I guess something that we can come back to maybe later is this whole concept of decentralized identity and self-sovereign identity. But I'll, I'll park that one for now. That's uh, that's actually a, a very pertinent point. Um, sorry, one of the comments that's come across on the Q and A, and I think this came up when you were talking particularly about those larger organisations, Sean, um, who are you know who do know an awful lot about us, um, and uh, you know and the comment that's come up that consumers don't trust these organisations, and that's sort of the context or the part of the context that we we find ourselves in today. Uh, you know, whether this is a, a knee-jerk reaction to some of the worst excesses that we've seen of the large digital players and, and their sort of perceived arrogance in the way that they um, they uh, use the information that they have, uh, the inherent weaknesses, as there will be in any ecosystem, you know, that are exploitable by bad actors. Um, and so we are talking about, uh, you know, the the incidence of, uh, of trust in digital transactions. And I suppose that throws up the question, who are the best guardians of people's data? You know, and that's a, that's a huge question. I certainly don't expect us to be able to answer that in any meaningful way today. But, you know, as David mentioned, self-sovereign identity is a concept relatively new to me. The idea that the citizen um, owns and manages and uh, allows the sharing of their personal data, um, not necessarily their identity, but their attributes to be able to interact with the digital world is a you know, hugely exciting democratic concept, if you like. Um, is it a realistic one? That's, uh, I mean, and whoever wants to jump in on that, you know, is it realistic to us to, uh, to the, you know, given that you have, very large companies spending huge and huge amounts of money is it realistic that we, it will that self-sovereign identity or something like it will come to pass without significant regulatory and legal intervention so i, I can jump in quickly on that one um so really the concept of self-sovereign identity it's not about the user themselves um that is basically crafting and if you like owning their own identity. So it's about taking the physical proofs that we already have that are assigned to us by our governments, you know, birth certificates, and passports, etc. Um, and it's about the, the user actually maintaining and holding that information. And then what the decentralized identity framework does is provides a mechanism for the user to be able to selectively share that information. And then in order for the person, the recipient, to have any trust or confidence that what I'm telling them is true, those bodies that typically would have been the sources of the KYC information then act as verifiers. So I can say to a new merchant that my name is David Pollington and I live at a particular address. They don't know whether or not that's true. They don't know if I'm a fraudster, but they can actually go and verify that information with say a telco or a utility company or a bank. And then you get this kind of like, you know, microfinance approach here, micropayments where, you know, the verifiers then actually earn a bit of money for actually verifying that what I've said is actually true. So, you know, if you think about um, often, you know, when you register at a hotel, they actually want to either take your passport off you or they want to go and take a photocopy of your passport. And I think at least for me and probably for all of us, that makes us a bit uncomfortable. You know, why, yeah. why are they taking away my credential? Absolutely. But online, we do this all the time. We give this information away all the time. So really all self-sovereign ID is doing is saying, well, hang on, in the digital world, we should be doing things the same as we do in the physical world. I shouldn't be giving away my passport. I should be holding my passport myself. And if someone wants me to prove my identity, I can assert that information and then verify as the government, or whoever it may be, who gave me that proof in the first place can attest that what I've said is true. And that's all you really need then. And, you know, so everyone can still participate in this open framework. 
Um, there's still very much a monetization uh, opportunity there. Great. Um, I've got one uh, question from the audience. It's from Paul. Let me, uh, let me just read it out in full. Um, it's quite pertinent, I think, here. Is it possible that other external entities might enter this market, given the possibility of monetizing this information? Certainly the financial players, credit card banks, etc., cetera, um, which you mentioned. Could you foresee a neutral player such as perhaps ICANN as a non-profit? Is that a crazy idea? Uh, Frank, is that a crazy idea? Forgive me, I'm not quite sure who ICANN is, but uh, I think the way this market is going to evolve, and it's already starting to do that, is um, at the point at which you assert your identity, it's a bit like logging in with LinkedIn or Facebook, a whole bunch of attributes can be released. And rather than coming from one place, which is where a lot of people who are talking about a self-sovereign identity, thinking uh, they're trying to create a wallet of everything about you, mm. the way in which it's, it looks as if it's gonna work is that I, I knock on a door to, to access a website, for example. I kind of lean over my shoulder and say, look, you don't trust me. My bank will, will vouch for me and say that I am who I am. I'm now gonna to link to my university, who's gonna vouch for my degree. I'm gonna link over there to the passport office. I'm gonna link over there and I'm gonna link over there to actually instantiate those attributes at the point at which they're created. And even at that point in time, the data associated with those attributes don't actually have to pass across to the other organization. That organization just needs to know, I've got a driving license, I've got a passport, they're all valid, I've got a degree certificate, and so on and so forth. So the other thing that's, that's, that's starting to happen is that you put the user in the flow and allow them to not just consent for those attributes, but also to consent for how those attributes are, are translated across. Okay. Um, thank you. Sean, um, I, I mean, bearing in mind that, that, so can you envisage an organization, um, I've just got an explanation actually from Paul of what ICANN is, but, you know, a non-profit organization that will, I suppose, manage, you know, be the uh, a centralized repository of, uh, of data and that holds, that throws up a, a whole he heap of questions, you know, rather than have this sort of multitude of uh, commercial organizations. Uh, and the complexity, obviously, that that brings. Is there an opportunity for a, a, a single entity or a few, I, a, a few identity providers, um, you know, doing so on a non-profit basis? Is that a good idea? I, I think look, the, the non-profit basis makes a lot of sense. Uh, I can understand why that would be non-profit and it could be funded by us as individuals in, in that sense. Um, I think there's the broader challenge uh, that we'd face with this is actually you can probably do it on a country level, but you certainly wouldn't be able to do it on a global level. Can you imagine the Russians, the Chinese, the Japanese all putting all of their data in the same silo and go, hey guys, it's all good. And then, oh, let's bring in North Korea and South Korea and the USA and the rest of Europe and all put it in one repository. I mean, it's a, ha it's a hacker's dream to be able to then get all of that information. So whilst up here it seems like a great idea and in the, the sort of ideal world, it would be wonderful to have one single entity. For those reasons, it will never happen. There are, there are too many political barriers in the way to prevent that from happening. But I do believe we could absolutely have organizations in country. And then the only question is, how do you glue those countries together? in terms of transferring the data. So standards and interoperability are the, are the key issues there. Okay, um, I'm a bit mindful of time. Um, we've got another uh, question here from Frederick. Again, let me read this out. How do current authentication method, methods such as OpenID, Facebook Connect, Google Authenticator, SAML, or methods based on X509 certificates or some government EID solutions comply with data privacy requirements? That's a really big question. Um, one knows that with the first methods, identity providers have the means to know everything we do and our privacy is not protected or the second method forces us to leave a record of our transactions with all service providers who authenticate us. Both families do not comply with data, so I'm missing off there, I assume that's uh, data privacy requirements. Um, that's a really big question there, I think. Um, 
how do current authentication models comply with data privacy requirements? Anyone in a position to answer that question? It's a it's an interesting question. It's a big question. As you said. I think we've all just taken a deep breath and gone. <laughs> First Frederick, one, Fred, Fred, Frederick, that's a really good question, and uh, you get the prize for uh, for stumping us. Um, and it's not a question. I'm also thinking of time where we're sort of fast running out of time, and that's a really big question. We could uh, certainly, I think, it, um, I've had question. I've had conversations. I think with David and and his colleagues around uh, this type of stuff. So. It's not that we can't answer it. I, I think um, let me try and let me try and address that in the uh, in the blog to follow. Um, I'll certainly uh, keep that uh, uh, on board and, and try to address it. Uh, thank Ian, you. Ian, could I just step back on the previous question, which may be useful to kind of get to the end of this? Please. So, so as I said, the, gov the current government uh, through the gov.uk verify scheme are looking to throw out the scheme to the private sector, hmm. and part of their ambition is to also create a, a set of standards to which organizations could ascribe themselves to so that they can become identity providers. That could include the banks or MasterCard or whoever. Because ultimately, when we're talking about creating um, a ubiquitous interoperable scheme, we've also got to think of you know, us as citizens and the users who will actually trust it. Mm -hmm. because, um, because at the moment, you know, who's, who's, now, who's now going to use Facebook to log in somewhere, apart from the you know, people who are not actually going to trust you logging in as Facebook. Plus, you're not, you're not the client there. You have, no, you have no access to your, well, you have access to your data, but you don't own it. Mm -hmm. So the government is building some frameworks, uh, trusted kite marks, uh, for, if you want to call it, and some standards by which, you know, people could become um, uh, identity providers. Without, with, within Europe, there's something called the EIDAS scheme, if I got that right, David. And, yeah. and that is something that's, that's now being uh, put into place throughout Europe, where one country will accept the identity of an, of an individual from another one. And we've already got some interoperability between the, the, the government scheme in this country and the government scheme there. But again, I've mentioned the word scheme, and that currently operates within the sort of the governmental level. I suspect that there may be schemes that may end up working in finance, in healthcare, and in other sectors, because they will all have their own uh, slightly different nuances of levels of assurance, and also the attributes that are needed for you to actually assert your identity and do something with it. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I've just got another question in. That leads me uh, very briefly. I don't. Need, I'd like to touch on this quite briefly. Um, I, I I know about Verify uh, in the UK. I think it's um, from a security perspective uh, a really really good uh, initiative. I would um, say that the usability uh, in terms of setting up and using it has not been the best experience I've ever had. How important is that? you know, uh, optimizing that balance between security and usability for, um, uh, uh, for an identity solution? I think I know the answer, but uh, you guys? <laughs> Look, I, if I'll, I'll say, I think the answer is obvious. It has to be as easy as possible. But equally, uh, one little uh, story. About a year ago, January, you could use your verified, your verified identity to access a government gateway in order to speed up you getting a rebate. Guess what? There was a spike in traffic. <laughs> so whilst these things can be problematic, unless you can persuade the citizen that there is sufficient value to invest in doing it because it's interoper interoperable and it can be reused, then of course people will say, well, it's, it's, it's a headache and therefore I can't be bothered. Okay. Okay. Um Given our time, and we've got a couple of questions left, I've just had a, a further uh, interjection from Lee. Lee's put, we talked a lot about identity, which we know is complex. What about building trust? Um, so with that in mind, just moving on to the last two sort of questions that I uh, initially put to you as, uh, as part of the webinar, is um, what types of identity solution are most likely to succeed and why? Um, David, can we start with you? Oh, that's an interesting one, identity solutions. Um, I, you know, I think for me, the thing that's always been missing from the internet is an identity layer. 
Uh, and this is essentially why a lot of the big players, such as Microsoft, are working in standards uh, bodies such as W3C and something called the, DI Central, uh, the Decentralized Identity um, Foundation, if to basically try and you know, create the hooks and ties that we need um, to basically um, you know, achieve this. So you know, I think with, with everything that's been happening with the misuse of data and the data breaches ramping and increasing over the past few years, it's, it's reached a crunch point now where I think there is concerted effort to really create an open standardized identity layer on the internet. Now, whether or not the big players want to actually use this or whether they like their silos is obviously a very you know, good and open question. So it's difficult to see the direction that it could go, but at least I think there is sufficient momentum around these more open decentralized approaches that I think they do stand a good chance of, of succeeding. And, and driving a kind of a sea change, but let, let's see. Uh, okay, and uh, Sean, um, what's what's the, the the most likely to succeed, and why for you? I think, given everything that uh, that we do as Trinomi, um, and speaking to to our customers and taking their insight, they're they're more bothered about fixing their own problems internally. So what is the identity inside of an organization? So in some organizations, it will be a passport, it will be a driving license, it will be a utility bill. In other organizations, it will just be an email address. It'll be an email address and a mobile number. It will be any, any variance of these. And I think initially we, we've got a two tier approach from everything that I'm seeing. And, and we're in this sort of this first tier working with organizations where we don't care what you use for KYC today. Once you've gone through our system, we can attest that that actually is the information that you've, you've said it is. And we become that ledger of people calling in to identify that particular piece of information. And I think what we're going to see is organizations build their own version of this over the coming years. And then I think as governments and big organizations start to solve identity on a global level, then these should, if they're built on interoperable standards that exist today in the marketplace then they should all roll up into it and it then shouldn't affect a BAU process for any business. The big challenge today if you speak to an organization is they don't want to bring complexity into their organization, they don't want to bring another layer in that makes it more difficult to do their job, they actually want a simplified solution in how they actually use this data, hold this data and what they can actually do with this data. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and uh, Frank, very quickly. Perhaps uh, coming at it tangentially, I think one of the other big challenges to solve on the internet is also the identity of organizations, which is why I'm actually quite excited by the GSMA uh, uh, RCS project, which is uh, to be able to provide messaging from organizations that actually comes with a verified logo to attest that it is actually who the organization is, because there's, there's fraud on two sides. There's fraud on me, as a, me potentially as an individual and organizations masquerading as, uh, as fake organizations. That's a very good point. And unfortunately, we've not had a lot of time to sort of cover that. That's uh, potentially a whole webinar on its, uh, it is. On its own. So um, one final question and sort of going back to, uh, you know, what, what Lee said, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about a very complex su subject. What about practical stuff? So if we've got enterprises on the call or look at this webinar, you know, later on, um, what, are, what are the practical steps that brands and enterprises can take today to ensure transactional security moving forward? Again, that's a massive question. So please, you know, jump in as you, as you feel as you feel appropriate. I think, so, so my take on this is perhaps a, 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 little, a little different. Um, I think it's time for organizations, whoever they are, that hold our identity and hold information that can identify us, any type of information. That's great. And, and we subscribe to these services and we, we pass over lots of information in order for these services to run. But if you've ever gone to have a look at what information is held about you, by an organization and how difficult it is to get that information from the organization. I think there's a big thing around corporate social responsibility and consumer data that needs to be addressed. And the brands that grab this quickly and do something about it can really make a step change difference in the marketplace. If you imagine the data that's held by a mobile operator on the likes of 
the four people on this call right now and then the rest of the people the the level of information that's held is is absolutely huge but we don't know why it's held what purpose it's being used for and i think it's time for people to stop harvesting data for for data's sake and start saying hey let's be upfront about this we're going to pull this data we're going to use this data for this and this is how you can change that we want to you to be a loyal customer to us and the first way of doing that is by being loyal to the customer in the first instance and exposing that data to the customer so the customer can now make an informed decision of what's happening with that data. Okay, so it's customer empowerment as a, a, as a, as a mechanism for solving that issue. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Frank? <clears throat> I concur with what Sean has said. And one of the biggest challenges out there in the market is that most large corporates could not actually answer the question as to what data they hold on, on, on us as individuals. Because if you, if you actually peel back, quite often there's some information about you in say an Oracle system, an SAP system, a Zen or whatever it is. There yeah. could be five or 10 or 20 different uh, databases Absolutely. and they haven't even bothered to create a, a single common UID to link you all together. Mm -hmm. The big joke is even, even some of the big global banks cannot report to their own board how many customers they've got. So the interesting thing is until they solve the, the good old fashioned um, single customer view or golden record of an individual within an organization, uh, they've got all sorts of challenges um, ahead of them. Okay, thank you. And uh, David, over to you. You know, I'd like to just bring it back to authentication. You know, we, we've been focusing a lot on identity. You know, it, it's a fact of life that we've had to give away our personal data to a lot of different companies, a lot of different services. They have this information. They're beginning to understand now the, the toxicity of having this information. So it's vitally important that they protect it. Um, and they need to protect it, not only, you know, to protect the, the privacy of the actual individuals that they serve, but also for their own business interests, because essentially every account, user account that they have, that they've registered, has a monetizable value for them, you know, customer lifetime value. So really it's about, for me, authentication. It's about, let's make sure if you've got this data, you are very sure who this person is that is now trying to access that data or use this data. So bringing into effect, you know, multiple factors of authentication and trying to increase security whilst keeping things simple for the user is a very tricky balance to get to. But it's very important because people, you know, consumers will not, uh, you know, raise objections or really even care about their security or their privacy until things go wrong. And then as a corporate, you're in the firing line because you're the one that's, that's let it happen. So, you know, authentication, I think it's got to be the watchword, you know, for the next 12 months. Let's kill the username password. Let's be a lot more creative ensuring that we protect the customer and that it's the right person that's accessing the right information. Sure. And hopefully uh, GDPR is the first step towards focusing the minds and, uh, and the hearts, hopefully, of brands and enterprises in that direction. We shall see as, uh, as things develop in that space. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, I'm sure I will be speaking with, uh, with all of you uh, at some point over the coming months on, on this and similar subjects. Thank you very much for the audience uh, participation. Um, I'm so sorry there are a couple of questions I didn't quite get to. I will come back to those people individually. Um, and please keep an eye out for our email with the link to the recording for this and for the blog, which I now have to go away and write over the next few days. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thanks again, gentlemen. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all at the next uh, Mobile Connect Digital webinar at the end of April. If uh, anyone's got any questions for me directly, please. It's Ian, spelled I-A-I-N, at mobileecosystemforum.com. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.